I'll start actually by making it simpler. It's about complexity, you just said it. Uh, but I would like to say it's simple. It's all about innovation. Innovation makes all the difference. And we truly believe that without innovation we cannot master the challenges which are ahead of us. And this is why we chose as a board to let these days happen, these three days, and indeed I, I mirror the perception of Thomas, it's, it's weird to stand in front of a camera and not see you all here. But it's even better actually than seeing you all here because I know that I can reach many more people than I would usually reach. So it's all about innovation because only, only innovation can make us successful in these times. And um, let me share what it's all about first. Thomas just said it, we might be the last generation who has the chance to really deliver sustainability to our modern societies around the world. And without sustainability, without a sustainable energy system, we will not reach the climate targets of 1.5 degrees uh, that we have to achieve to keep our planet as it is today or even better. But if you look what needs to happen actually so that we can reduce our CO2 emissions to an extent that we reach the 1.5 degrees target, it seems that this is absolutely impossible. We would need to reduce our demand to an extent which people struggle with while everybody tries to develop, while population is still rising, how can we really reduce our demand? We would need to increase renewable energy production to an extent which is mind-boggling. So in that sense, innovation can be the only way out. And, and the beauty about innovation is, once you have it, it makes stuff possible that you thought is completely impossible before. And so let me share one story which I read two years ago in a book. You might remember the Matterhorn in the Alps, which was the last big mountain, the last big summit to be climbed. And for years and years, all the best climbers tried to get on top of the Matterhorn. And it seemed to be a huge challenge. And then eventually, somebody managed to get up there. And eight years later, and that's the story which I want to share, the British king was in Zermatt. Now, the British king was not a great climber. But since he saw the Matterhorn, he actually hired some guides and they brought him on top of the Matterhorn. So the seemingly impossible challenge of getting on top of the summit just a few years later was mastered by a complete amateur. And that's innovation. Innovation paves the path to what seemed unbelievable before. Now, these three days are what we as utilities have to do. It's about, we just heard it, electrification, connectivity, digitization. This is what we have to do as utilities. But why do we have to do this? Why is this what we need to do to actually provide sustainable energy to the world? Because this is what we need to do to continue to fulfill our mission. And I'm completely passionate about energy because we are the best industry to work in, uh, which I know. And why? because we provide the foundation of modern societies to the people. Without energy, there is no modern society. A modern healthcare system is not possible without energy. And we provide this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year round, no matter what. But we need to do this differently in the future than in the past. And I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on that one. So, um, electrification, digitization, connectivity are good things to work on. It's really a mission. And a good mission is challenging. And I'll give you a few reasons now in a second why we actually see a huge challenge. And number one, is the size of the challenge, number two is the speed at which we need to adapt, and number three is the system complexity which we need to master. So on the size, electrification, what are we really talking about? 
we are talking about the need to increase massively the production of electricity and the electricity supply to our customers whilst reducing primary energy demand. And now I can pick any number you want. I take here the IEA numbers, International Energy Agency. In the next 20 years, we would need to grow electricity demand from worldwide from 27,000 terawatt hours to 40,000 terawatt hours, up by 50% worldwide. In Europe, it would be from 3,000 to 5,000. And for those who are not so familiar with the numbers, Germany, for example, is 600 terawatt hours of electricity. So in Europe alone, we would need to add three times Germany in, in terms of the electricity system. Three times only in Europe, or if you do that, 21 times around the world. 21 times one of the largest ele uh, electricity you know, in industrial countries in the world. And we have to do this with sustainable, renewable electricity. All in 20 years. That's a huge challenge by itself. Think about the amount of wind and solar and other sources that we need for that. But the other one is we don't in only need to produce this huge amount of energy. We also need to bring it to our customers. We need reliable networks. And we need to massively increase the capacity of our networks to deliver the amount. And we massively need to invest into the flexibility of our energy systems, of our networks, so that they can cope with this. Because this huge amount of electricity which we're talking about is different from the past, not predictable, but much more volatile. And on top, we have then to make sure that we also provide energy for heat purposes, for industrial purposes. And in these days, we talk a lot about hydrogen, and we also have it in the sessions today, as you have seen. And that, in the end, is also an indirect way of electrifying our energy system. So it's a huge challenge just from the size. Adding multiple times Germany to the system, and Germany being one of the largest systems worldwide, from the complexity, but also from the mindset, because all the processes, systems, and assets which we have put in place over the last decades, over the last 100 years, cannot cope with this challenge. We need to massively rebuild it, and that's what we're going to talk about, probably mostly on day number three. The second challenge is not only a huge challenge, it's also a challenge of speed. Again, one number, I take now any prediction. So we have now predictions that in Germany by 2035, 37% of Germany's car market will likely be electric. By 2040, all new cars and vans have to be emission-free in the UK. By 2040, Korea wants to have 3 million hydrogen vehicles uh, on the road. By 2025, the EU Commission wants 800,000 800, charging points within Europe. So again, huge numbers. Now, is this going to be the speed at which the system is going to change? In the first years, we might be a bit slower or faster, I don't know. But I'm absolutely sure about one thing. Once we get beyond a certain tipping point, the speed of change will be significantly higher than any prediction which we have today. Think about, again, my Matterhorn example at the beginning. Once we get beyond a certain point, we will see an acceleration which we absolutely believe to be impossible today. And uh, we will talk about in the next session, right after my uh, slot here, we will talk about... Um, electric mobility for trucks seems very remote. I'm sure we will be surprised in 20 years when we look back how fast the system has changed. So again, speed, size, but then system complexity. 
we are moving into a world in which we will have more of everything. We have in Germany 41 million households. Now think about, in average, 70% more electricity production uh, consumption per household. And we need to cope with it. Think about the internet of buildings which we need to build to cope with the volatility and complexity of this system. Now, e-mobility, one electric vehicle is like half a house when you look at it in terms of consumption. We have 40 million vehicles on the road. I just said the number of 40% is 16 million. So we are just adding 8 million households to Germany which are moving around and which have a very volatile consumption pattern. We need to control that. We have a feed-in of renewables into our networks, which is volatile. So much more demand, much more volatile, completely new uh, energy users, and a very volatile energy production. All of that we need to cope with. So it adds up to a triple challenge. We need to master the size, we need to master the speed, we need to master the system complexity so that we can electrify, connect and digitize so that we can achieve a secure, reliable and affordable energy supply to our modern societies at all times. And that's the challenge. Now, if you add up everything that you said, that I said, how can we do that without innovation? And the answer is, we can not. It's not a question of how many subsidies we have. All the subsidies in the world don't help us if we have no innovation. All the subsidies in the world make only sense if they trigger innovation. And therefore, it's really important that we embrace this topic. It's really important that we think about innovation to solve our challenges and not about anything else because nothing else will actually help us. So on these three days, pick the sessions which you like, you've seen the agenda, ask all the questions which you want to like, uh, which you want to ask. Make sure that you connect to other people, even remotely, virtually how this works. And um, I, I'm sure you will get out of these three days more optimistic than one tends to be at these times when some, somehow everything is different than it used to be. But everything being different than it used to be, that is what we are used to in the energy industry for decades now, but especially for the last 20 years. So thank you very much for attending. I hope you find this a really worthwhile time and I'm looking forward to get in touch with you also in the Q&A, which we're going to have right after now. Thank you so much, Dr. Birnbaum, for these insights and a deep look into this massive challenge ahead. Uh, now, before we get to all the questions from the audience, I want to take the opportunity to uh, say real quick that you have the chance to leave your questions for us on stage and to every expert that we're going to have today, tomorrow, and the day after. Uh, ask your questions. We will see the question, and I will bring them to the experts. So please feel free to ask. And um, yeah, let's start with the first one. Um, you talked about the size, the speed, and the complexity as three major challenges. And you said the only way out is innovation. Um, so how, how do you think this, this massive transformation um, should be approached right now from a perspective of, okay, how do we get people to innovate? This is the starting point. So we know the challenge. This is obviously coming. What are we going to do? Yeah. I, I think actually... and. I also see on the screen one question coming up uh, right. from the Culture Institute of Technology. And they are asking, isn't it about actually deploying innovation? And I actually agree. It's all about innovation, but only if you can deploy it at scale. Mm -hmm. So innovation in wind turbines is irrelevant if you don't deploy wind at scale. Same for solar. Same actually for system controls actually in networks. If we don't deploy sensors at scale, we will not have a better information about the system. 
if we don't deploy you know control systems measurements and so at scale we cannot influence the system in, in more real time so what we need is a mindset uh, mind, uh, mindset shift we need to think what is the innovation which we can deploy at scale and fast and then we address both challenges the size and the speed mm -hmm. i think that that is the real challenge because our systems are huge mm -hmm. and that's often you know misunderstood the energy system is a huge system and to really change it you need a lot of aluminum copper and silicon Right, so there are natural restrictions of the scalability, uh, but th to get this fast scalability that you're looking for, um, there are probably there are technolog technological boundaries of what you can do, and you need to understand a lot more the innovation in the technology, mm -hmm. but then there's also, you, you probably have to convince a lot of people. Who do you think are the, the key drivers of this transition? Who needs to be on board, and who needs to maybe do more than they do now to really get there? Uh, maybe two answers. You need to convince everybody to contribute an element. You need to con uh, convince the regulator to actually make sure that regulation is such that innovation is actually not punished but rewarded. You need politics to put in place policies which support innovation, like also like uh, infrastructure innovation, uh, innovative inf infrastructure like broadband. You need to convince your own employees that this change is something good. Um, but more than everything else, and that's my second point, you need to convince the customers that they get what they want in a better way, more sustainable, and at the same time still affordable when you actually apply innovation. Because in the end, our customers are the ones paying it. And they always pay it, either via the bill or via the taxes that they actually have to give if subsidies are given. Mm -hmm. So, But if we can actually show and demonstrate that a certain innovation makes energy more sustainable, more reliable, more affordable, ideally all at the same time, then actually everybody will help to make that innovation happen. And then innovation really happens. Great. Okay, so there was one question from the audience. Maybe um, we can, we can uh, approach this. Uh, dear Mr. Birnbaum, what is your most favorite example of energy innovation in the past 20 years? Because we're talking a lot about the next 20 years, but what, what do you see as significant changes in the past 20 years? Your favorites. Is there something? No, I'm sorry. The, 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 the favorite picture I have in my head is uh, about wind turbines. If you look at uh, the first generation wind turbine and then how it grew in size. Yeah? So, and I can still remember in the uh, 90s, end of the 90s of the last uh, uh, century, actually we were struggling to have cranes which are able to actually pull up the blades uh, to the turbine, uh, the rotor yeah? right. um, of a windmill. And actually, we were struggling with 100 meters. Uh -huh. uh, and if you look at offshore wind turbines today, we are talking about a cell uh, 200 meters above the ground, a rotor diameter of more than 200 meters, just the diameter of the rotor. We're talking about 15 megawatts and more in next generations to come. And uh, I, that's my favorite. You know, We are talking about an Eiffel Tower, a wind turbine the size of an Eiffel Tower. That's maybe how you need to think about it. Or, uh, or the Shard in London. That's the size of a huge offshore wind turbine. I mean, that is innovation and it's amazing. So I think that's the most, they're fantastic ones in uh, network operations, in network control, but they are less sexy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. Um, so if you look at all the, the drivers of this to happen, so an innovation like the one you just described, there needs to be a lot coming together. There's, there's obviously there's academic research involved, and then there is corporate research involved, there's, there's the corporate structure involved, and then obviously there's regulation. What do you see, what is the role of re regulation, maybe going forward to the next five years? What's the role in this uh, innovation that has to happen, as you described? Okay. Right. The regulation has to do two things. It needs to provide... Uh, oh, three things. It needs to provide a level playing field for the market participants to actually deploy their resources. Uh, second, it needs to make sure that uh, the infrastructure providers actually can uh, get enough cash flow to make the investments which are required, and huge investments are required. And third, they need to actually put in place the right incentives. For example, incentivize actually uh, innovation. 
but uh, I would not overemphasize it. This is all absolutely crucial. But if we wait for the ideal, uh, you know, regulation before we do something, we will wait in a hundred years. So we need to work within the regulation which we have, but we need to push regulation in that direction which I just just described. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a, a question, or more of a comment from Alexander, saying it is not only a question of innovation, but much more of transparent visions and goals to be developed forwards. Uh, do you see that there's something missing or that there's something that can be improved in terms of transparency around goals and vision? Well, we as energy providers, I think we have a crystal clear vision and we have a real purpose. We provide the basis of modern societies. I said it in my speech. I mean, uh, we have all talked in this pandemic uh, around, you know, it's like uh, emergency rooms in hospitals and so on and how critical they are because uh, we don't have enough of them. And I always tend to say that might be system critical, but if there's no energy, you could just forget about all modern healthcare systems. It's just irrelevant. Uh, so I think our purpose is we provide this basis without a modern society can not work. If you're living in a skyscraper, yeah, try using your toilet once electricity is gone. Yeah? It will be a miserable life within hours. Yeah? So this is, this is our purpose. And now our mission is provide that CO2-free, yeah, sustainable, affordable for everybody yeah, in, a sh in a reliable way around the world to everybody also for the next 100 years. I think uh, I, I don't need more visions. That actually it translates already into challenges which are huge. Thank you. Um, yeah, this, you touched upon the customer right now. Um, to convince them is obviously part of the game. Mm -hmm. So uh, if they don't understand where you're going and why you're going that direction, um, this, is, this is even a bigger vision because it, it affects the user of, your, of what you provide, the fundamental basis of society. Um, Someone says, Garrett says that not all the customers are convinced at the moment. Um, how will Eon catch them? Yeah, with what exactly what I said a few minutes ago, we need to, we don't need to educate them to understand the complexity of the energy system. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're struggling ourselves with it. You know, why should we teach them? It's not their job. We should just provide to our customers products which they look at and say, that makes sense for me. That's a good product. It has advantages for me. This is innovation which is beneficial for me. And then they might even be willing to pay a bonus for the innovation. It's like our solar cloud. We actually provide a product to our customers which enables them to virtually store their, solar pro their surplus solar production. And that makes sense for everybody who has a solar panel on his rooftop. And this is the way to convince customers, not to give them a long speech. It's to give them something which is a good product for them and beneficial for them. So it's in the value of what you deliver. In the end, it's in the value. Mm. And then if they see this, then they will also pay for it. Mm -hmm. And then actually we don't need to ask always for subsidies, which in the end the same customers need to pay anyway, just as taxes and levies. You know? Right, yeah. Okay, um, here's, a, here's a question about the scalability of the business model. And there's another question linked to that. Maybe we can take them together. So is the E.ON business model as it is today scalable as it is um, beyond Europe? Um, and then the other question was uh, 20 years from now. So if you look at the future, what will E.ON look like? Is, is this going to be a completely digital distribution of energy company? Uh, what, what is the role going to be for E.ON in 20 years? Um, two, two good questions. I would say first, um, the business model is not scalable in the way you might think about, you know, a scalable Facebook, Amazon and so on. Mm -hmm. Because we scale with physical assets. Right? I mean, there's still aluminum and copper, there's still a cable which needs to come to your house to deliver the energy. And you cannot, you know, digitally scale the cable, so to say, the household connections. So uh, we scale with our assets. We don't scale virtually in that sense. But um, the way we actually run those systems, that is scalable. And that needs to be scalable. If every energy utility in the world invents the systems it needs in the future itself, it will be completely impossible to pay for our customers. Mm -hmm. 
there will be you know there will be a scaling of systems and there will be only a few who actually design these operating systems and obviously our aspiration needs needs to be that we are one of the players in the market who provides an operating system for the future world and that that operating system then scales even beyond eon asset base so yes it could be scalable so how will we be and then the second question is and that ties directly to it will we be digitally mm. and the answer is if we're not we will not be around okay that's a clear statement so it will be a digital company and alessandro asks so the, the innovating um, is a must it's a given and just as you said there's no way around that um, but how do we convince the business units to actually accept that kind of innovation um, and especially when it comes to the size you talked about the speed and then the complexity this is this is a massive challenge how do you con convince the business units i I think actually I do not need to convince anybody of our top leadership team that we need innovation. Mm -hmm. The challenge is how do I actually make sure that they can deploy innovation with all the other uh, constraints which they have in place, yeah? because they're still sh supposed to deliver their budget, they're still de supposed to deliver their midterm plan, they're still supposed to do whatever targets we've put on and that you know it's kind of like and they they asked me we would love to innovate but how can we innovate with all the constraints which we have and i or with you know like uh, with the they have constraints from the people they have available to actually innovate so i think uh, i don't need to convince them that they need to innovate i think the challenge when it comes to the businesses is how can I help to create an environment in which they can do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And there, obviously, I think there's, there's lots of ground still to be covered mm -hmm. because we are far from perfect. So a statement we hear very often in that respect is that people say they have their normal job and then they need to do innovation on the side on top because that's a new requirement of every job. We all need to innovate now. Um, but there's no time and there's usually no money. That's what people say. This. And you said you have to create an environment in which this can happen. Um, so now you, as I... No, I, so sorry, I need to interrupt. Yeah, please. This is always the difference between the urgent stuff and the important stuff. Yeah. And I tell you, without innovation, I try to say that, without innovation, we are dead. Yeah? As a society, but also as a utility and as a company. Yeah? So we need to absolutely innovate. If we have so much day-to-day -day work, then we need to figure out w what is actually not so urgent. Yeah? I, I just opened my thir first 30 emails this morning. It took me 30 seconds to just delete them because they were all irrelevant spam. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. So, uh, Urgent stuff is not the important stuff. Innovation is important. Yeah, and that means it will be part of everybody's job. Needs to be. Yes. All right. Um, this brings me to a question about uh, to provide these solutions, uh, you also have to have profound partnerships. Um, it's not something that you as a company do by yourself on your own. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of partnerships are you looking for or do you see need to happen? I think the important partnerships are the ones that add capabilities to what we can do today. Mm -hmm. It's not, we don't need that many, you know, we have partners which provide assets to us, hardware and whatever. Uh, we have suppliers which are great partners with whom we work together intensively s since decades. But what we need today in addition are partners that provide capabilities which we don't have or do not have sufficiently in-house. And I think that the, the challenge for us is to bring such partners in so that we can innovate more. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm really looking for. I'm really looking for capability. And in return, probably there is a lot. Eon can offer these partners who have capabilities, uh, possibilities, skills that you're looking for. Um, in this exchange, how do you see this co-opetition? Uh, I think that's the new normal. Yeah? The, I mean, new normal. the new normal is that you work together with competitors and but also acknowledging that even though you are competing with somebody you might have exactly the same interest mm -hmm. so we might be competing with other utilities with other system operators but we have the same desire to change the energy system we have the same challenge to make it more sustainable and if everybody does it on its own we are all not going to be successful so whilst competing you can still cooperate you know, 
when it comes to the target which you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, there, there's a question about the speed again. Uh, the speed of innovation, the speed of implementation are often driven by competition. And you just said, no, we were open to cooperate even with maybe people who seem or companies who seem competitors. Uh, do we have enough competition is this question, though? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> enough competition. What else, what else would you expect from me? No, no we have intense competition. Uh, and uh, everybody who says we don't have enough competition, I invite Come and see yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, there is a question that came up. Th Thomas brought it up already, um, and it's here again. Um, and we'll, later today, we will have a, a speech on sustainability and how to measure it um, by Microsoft. Um, and here's a question about the societal and behavioral changes. Uh, that Are these necessary to meet the environmental goals that you were talking about? Yeah, the answer is... I personally believe yes. Yeah? So if you look at emissions worldwide and what needs to happen, for example, to reduce really uh, to a 1.5 degree target, yeah. so then you would need to look beyond CO2, for example, also at methane. You look at agriculture, you know, pasture, then you will realize if our meat consumption in Western world actually, you know, is uh, rolled out uh, to the whole world, we will struggle. Yeah? And... Um, Actually, so we would need to consume less, yeah? Um, and I love meat. I love a decent <laughs> steak, yeah? So don't get me wrong, I'm not vegetarian. But I acknowledge that if we just continue the way we did in the past, and if the whole world does it, we cannot prevent the world actually doing what we ourselves do, then actually it will become difficult. However, we are a democratic society and I'm adamantly negative on prescribing people what to do. Actually, if anything, I think it's important that people actually choose to do something. Otherwise, we might lose social acceptance for what we're trying to achieve. And that, I think, would be the worst disaster uh, for us uh, as an energy transition. So, yes, I believe we need to change. All of us need to change the way we live, we, the way we work. But we should find ways to do that that is compatible with a democratic society and the free will of people to make actually choices. That's a big statement. Um, in, in, in my uh, home, in my newfound home in California, uh, many of the big corporations there, especially the digital ones, um, say we're moving to becoming more and more political actors. And that means we also have to have a political opinion. So now you just mentioned that there's a democratic process in which there's freedom to choose. But is E.ON involved in telling people um, recommendations about how to live life? Because you're so fundamental for everything they do. Yeah, I think we are actually trying to help them to be, for example, energy efficient. Mm -hmm. But who am I to tell you what you should be doing in your free time? Why wouldn't you tell me, actually? Mm, okay. So, uh, in that sense, I think modesty is important. Yeah? Um, I can have personal convictions, and I can tell you how to actually, uh, how to actually get a sustainable, renewable energy supply for your home, if you have one, or to buy a green product, if you want to, uh, or to actually be more energy efficient, and so on. This, I can help you. And here, I try to convince you, I try to change you. But whether you actually choose to fly to Italy or to South Africa in your vacation, or whether you do a weekend trip every weekend with a plane just for a day somewhere in Europe. Now, in COVID times, that's a dream, right. I acknowledge. Yeah, But who am I to tell you? But actually, I think this is a, this is a dispute which we need to have in society. So I'm absolutely political. Yeah? So I'm a political animal. I believe in democracy. I believe in Europe. We need European markets. Uh, I believe uh, that uh, politics are important to provide the, f uh, you know, the, 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 the framework in which you operate. But I do not believe in companies and smart people telling other people what to do. I believe in people thinking discussing and coming to conclusions themselves. Thank you. Might um, be optimistic, but optim <laughs> optimism optimistic. is important. Optimism is important. It is. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, and and there is maybe a question about your optimism, and that's where it's coming from. What's your source of innovation inspiration? What inspires you at E.ON or beyond? Uh, if I just see what we have already achieved. 
I'll give you one example. Uh, we own the distribution system in uh, Bavaria. I mean, most of the rural Bavarian areas. And that in Germany is the part in which most of the solar panels have been deployed, especially in the initial phase. So it, the solar part of Germany is the southern part of Germany. It's especially Bavaria. And now we have added uh, hundreds of thousands of solar installations in a few years, which needed a huge machine. And to install all of that solar, we needed to rebuild the medium voltage distribution level from scratch. The medium voltage distribution level today in Bavaria is a completely different one than the one 10 years ago. It has nothing to do with each other. And we have done that without anybody even noticing it. Yeah? So what gives me optimism is we have already achieved uh, so much. Nobody in the world has connected more renewables to the grid than the Germans, and especially in Germany than E.ON. Nobody, by far, by a far margin. So nobody has actually seen more challenges in controlling volatile feed-in. The algorithms for actually curtailing wind turbines to actually avoid the grid from being overloaded come from E.ON employees, this time in the north of Germany, because they just had so much wind and so much stress on the system. So my optimism comes, we have achieved already so much, we will, uh, we will manage the rest as well. Perfect. Um, then we have two more questions about this, this future that we're going into. Um, one is the, the capabilities that you touched upon earlier that we might look for in partnerships. What exactly do you see as capabilities that you would bring in to E.ON that you might not have yet? I would not like to be now be very specific because I said it, it's capabilities, it's very specific skills. Yeah? Yeah. We might not have enough analytic skills when it comes to certain, you know, like data scientists or whatever, or network operations guys, or cyber security guys. Isn't so, and actually, the answer might change over time as new innovations come into the market. But we are talking about such skills. We are talking about engineering skills to do asset management in a, in a way that actually is already looking at what is coming and preparing us for the future before the future hits us. So that might be you know, very traditional engineering skills, but still we might not have enough of them. Yeah? So again, and once we have worked two years on one constraint and added capabilities, we might figure out that in reality we have a capability gap somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So let's not be too specific. We will need experts all over the place. And one of that area of expertise that's definitely coming up, and there was a question about that, is the question of artificial intelligence. And the question was not so much about E.ON, but is the world of energy in general ready for artificial intelligence, for data science on a next level to take over? Um, I, I think it's not the question whether we are ready, but the question is, uh, the question is a different one. We are a huge system, and um, we, are, we will be producing a huge amount of data. Let's, for example, install smart meters, 20 million, 40 million smart meters in Germany. We're going to produce data like hell. You know? So uh, wherever there is data, we need somebody to do something with the data. We need computing power. You know? Computing power is getting cheap. Everybody knows that. But I tell you, so we will need to actually put into place more control, more computing power, whilst we produce more data, and inevitably that will draw artificial intelligence to come to us. So if we are not ready for it, AI will just not care and come anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's almost like electri electricity. Yeah. <laughs> it just overrolls the whole... But AI without electricity won't work. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> right. Um, here's a question about the renewables and specifically about Germany. Uh, will the renewables be enough to turn Germany carbon neutral or would we need to import green energy? Yeah, that's, uh, that's I think, one of the most fascinating uh, discussions. We have realized that if Germany stays in industrialized society as we are today, we will not be able to provide the energy for such a society completely from Germany. So the belief that some people had in the past, which I never shared, by the way, that we can become independent uh, of others uh, when it comes to energy by adding more and more wind and wind and solar, I don't, I don't share. 
And if you look at the studies which have been done, for example, by the German Industry Association, you see in the last two years ago, I believe, you can see that there is a huge amount of energy import, for example, via hydrogen or methane or whatever, uh, which is produced and maybe somewhere else. So we will probably need an international supply chain of renewables, always making the assumption that we stay in industrialized and rich country, which I think we all want to stay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and then uh, and another question that just came up um, related to uh, finance and investments. Um, how can we finance the vast amount of investments needed in infrastructure without increase the burden on customers? You touched I, upon that yeah. before. Yeah. I, I do not believe that you can actually make huge investments into infrastructure without anybody, anybody paying for it. Mm -hmm. The question is, can you make other parts more efficient? And for example, we have seen that introducing auctions into renewables has been a way of actually minimizing and reducing the cost to customers significantly. So I, my answer is, um, I would say, by having market forces work, by having more innovation, and therefore less, both will lead to less waste. But I caution that at the same time, there's nothing like a free lunch. Somebody in the end will pay. The question is just how much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it might be the customer, or, or the taxpayer, be, or it's, the taxpayer. It's, but right. it's the same because the customers are the taxpayers. Right. W the new energy ecosystems are expanding, combining energy, building, industry, mobility, and retail. What's your view? Very general question by Stefan. It's great. <laughs> we are utility. All of that means that our market is getting bigger. <laughs> so. I like it. Yeah. So what shall I say? Uh, we are moving, I said it, in a world of more of everything. More electricity, more sensors, more devices, more connections, more networks. And that's all great for us. So I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, uh, but it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's we a challenge. To. And it's an opportunity at the same time. And this may be my last question to you. Um, this, this challenge, challenge always takes, and Thomas t said that, uh, it takes passion to push forward. Yeah. Where is your passion going to go in the next years to really make E.ON this company that you envision? Where is your passion projects? What, what do you see? I'm just overwhelmed by the question because <laughs> I was, uh, uh, if we can master all of what we just said at the same time, plus all the day-to-day -day challenges which have nothing to do with innovation, which, we, which are still there, yeah? I think then we can be so proud. So my passion, I think, comes from a true pride. We do something meaningful and we do it in a way which is pretty, and I wouldn't say unique, but which is great because it's not done by everybody around the world. So, but one should stay modest, but I say, that's my, my passion is, I do, if I do my job right, if my company does its job right, people will actually look at us and say, these guys are great. Uh, and, and that, I think that gives me, you know, that gives me the energy to say, uh, no matter what, we'll manage it somehow also tomorrow.